Hi. It is Hannah, the Kombucha Mama, here at Kombucha Camp. Just a few moments, I'm going to be joined by Jenny McGrother of Nourish Kitchen. I am so excited to have Jenny on today. She's one of my oldest friends in the real food space, and uh, we are just going to have an awesome conversation about her newest book and fermented foods and all the great things that keep our bodies really healthy. So glad to have you here. Thanks so much for joining us. And um, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. So if you have any questions, you're welcome to go ahead and drop those into the chat now. I'm going to get through as many of those as I can. It's so good to see you here. Hi, Lydia. Hi. Hola, Angeles de Oaxaca. Bienvenidos. Siempre encanta que personas por todo el mundo podemos reunir con nosotros. So, muchas gracias para estar aquí, Ángel. All right. So, one of the things, um, you know, Jenny is someone I met in um, 2010. So, we have known each other over a decade, which is really exciting. And um, thanks, Lydia. Um, and um, she was one of the first people I met when I learned about real food. And for those of you out there, you might be thinking, well, all the food that I eat is real because I put it in my mouth and it's real. Um, and that's not exactly what we're talking about when we're talking about real foods. We're talking about traditional food. We're talking about food that um, provides a lot of nutritional value. And um, a lot of those foods have been maligned uh, over the years. And a lot of those foods have been turned into simulacrum. So an example of that would be lard, which comes from uh, pig fat, uh, and then Crisco, which is a vegetable shortening. And so vegetable shortening looks a lot like lard, and yet it does not have the same nutritional benefit. So that's what I'm talking about when I say simulacrum. Hello, Virgin Islands, welcome. So good to have you here. I did see a question about tea, so we'll get to talk about that in just a moment. Um, Just hang tight for a second. Let's see if we can find Jenny here. All right. That moment when I think I've done it right. Pressed. All right. Well, we're so glad to have you here. So I was just talking about real food, traditional foods versus simulacrum, which is unfortunately what a lot of our food supply is these days. Hello from Tucson, Arizona in the house. Already I'm heating up, so I'm gonna take the little sweater off here. Um, so, uh, you know, I am sad, or I was sad, in that I ate a standard American diet. And so that was a lot of processed foods. You know, interestingly, I remember when we only drank whole milk and then we started doing whole and 2% and then they tried to get us to scan, but honestly, my body was like, no, thank you. Um, <laughs> it was like, what is even the point here? And I think instinctively my body knew that without the fat, there was really no purpose in drinking this fluid, it, difficult enough that it was pasteurized. And so um, my body protected me. It was the same thing with diet sodas. I know that became super popular. And of course we drank a lot of soda growing up because again, that was just sort of what you did. Um, and yet for some reason, my body just absolutely detested the flavor of diet soda. So I think again, it was just instinctively protecting me. And of course I didn't learn so much more about why my body um, didn't care for these products until much later. Yes, Booch uh, from the heart. I see your turkey tail question. Absolutely. Um, we can definitely um, experiment. And in fact, the Big Book of Kombucha has 260 flavoring recipes, including ones with mushrooms. So uh, we always love that kombucha and Jun and water kefir, all of these are really flexible technology because we can work with so many different ingredients and yield really great results. Um, this is especially true of kombucha and Jun because their trace amount of alcohol content and the fact that their acetic acid ferments means that they have um, that they have uh, a, the solvent ability. And so um, as a solvent, that means they can extract the nutrients. <gasps> Hi, Jen. Hey, Hannah. I'm so glad.
good to have you here. Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm giving you a huge virtual hug because it's been too long. Since I've it has you. been too long, for sure. Well, thanks so much for joining us here today. We have a great group of folks who are really excited to hear about us. So, you know, I was telling them that we have been friends for over a decade. Yes. Um, I feel like we first met in person at the um, Weston A. Price Conference in Dallas, I want to say in 2010. Does that ring a bell? Gosh, I think it was the Freestone Fermentation Festival. Do you remember Oh, that? yeah, you're right. No, you're totally right about that. It was Freestone <laughs> Fermentation Festival yeah. in 2009. Yeah. That was, uh, that was so fun. That was a fun festival. Well, and it was so foundational. Michael Pollan was a speaker there. This was before his, you know, so many of his other books about that included for many foods came out. He was doing That's a lot right. of research. Sandor was there. We had um, Nato at that reception. That was like <laughs> the first time I'd ever tried Nato. And uh, <laughs> that's that's some interesting stuff. If you haven't tried it, it's got a really unique texture, but apparently once you get over the um, ick factor, it, it has a lot of really great nutrients. Yeah, like super high in vitamin K2, right? It's like that and Gouda cheese are your two best sources. <laughs> Maybe some yes, and if you can't do the dairy, do the not. Right. Well, in, in Asia, they put it over rice, which I think is an easier way to enjoy it. Yeah, I like it over rice. Also with like um, some salmon roe on top, I think is delicious that sounds really delicious yes <laughs> well i would we that festival was pretty amazing um after that festival i ended up going to osmosis spa where they had this again a fermentation based treatment right. did you do that were you did you try that i out? never had time to do that yeah. like it was like we were on a like a big trip right so we just didn't have time to do that but Fun. Well, just briefly, in case people were curious what it was, is basically they took some sort of buckwheat or some sort of mixture that was inoculated with enzymes. This is a Japanese technique. And they bury you, like, up to your neck in, <laughs> in this enzymatic stuff. I mean, it just felt like they were putting sawdust over you. But it was this real comfortable, warm feeling. And, again, it was fermented, and they would, you know, switch it out every week so it could be used with multiple people because it's naturally antimicrobial. And it was just pretty tremendous. So um, if everyone's ever up in the Freestone area, that's Northern California, look up Osmosis Spa. Um, and there's such a great plethora of wonderful fermented food and drink companies up there as well. So, yeah. yes, you're absolutely right. That was where we first met. That's and um, But then, of course, our relationship continued as we both were um, part of Weston A. Price Foundation, and we were really um, huge advocates for traditional foods. And just tell us a little bit about how Nourish Kitchen got started, because I believe you were blogging way before I was. Yeah, I think it started, my site started in 2007. And it was like, I was coming off vegetarianism. I was new to this concept of traditional food pathways. And um, I was working outside of the home and I had a young child. And my husband was a stay at home dad. And so, um, you know, he was responsible for cooking and he would make some like crazy concoctions. I think that there was this one recipe that was like salmon and Frank's red hot sauce and cinnamon. And I was just like, oh honey, I can't do this anymore. And so I started putting recipes, my recipes on a blog so that he could, I would be, he'd be like, what do you want for dinner? I'm like, oh, make this, you know? And I'd send him the link. Well, so it was a very Nourish Kitchen, started off as a way to communicate with my husband the recipes that we that we wanted to make at home <clears throat> and from there you know other people started following and then it became bigger and bigger and bigger um and now it's you know we've got three cookbooks out and um take up our space i guess <laughs> yeah no and i mean i think what people really wanted or what they really resonated with nourish kitchen was an approachable way to incorporate real foods in their diet so i was sort of breaking down what real foods versus simulacrum are and sort of traditional foods and you know the unfortunate reputation that some of them has have gained just right. because of nutritional misinformation um but it's uh it it you know, I think what's really cool about right now, 11 years or, you know, a decade and a half hence, is that what we were talking about from a sort of small sliver of the world perspective has now become <laughs> right. more mainstream. Yes. I think that that's what stuns me so much is because way back when I, when I first started the site, nobody had heard of 
kombucha, right? And the idea that butter could be good for you was was brand new. We're, we're still into margarine, right? At that time, 15 years ago. Um, the concept of grass-fed beef, where holistically managed beef being mainstream was, it just wasn't heard of. And so you and I were both exploring these ideas, you know, a decade before they became popular. And it's just amazing to me to see how that grassroots movement that was largely pushed by women became so mainstream and fundamentally changed the American diet. I mean, if you would have told me 15 years ago that you could walk into any Kroger and find a house brand of kombucha, I just wouldn't believe it, right? Like it was, um, so I think that that's been what's the most amazing part of this journey is seeing how these foods that were obscure 15 years ago, bone broths and um, light cultured vegetables and kombucha have now become mainstream and, and fundamentally part of uh, an American food culture that had previously forgotten about them. Exactly, because to your point, these were foods that our traditional cultures incorporated on a regular basis. Right. And so really we're reuniting the old with the new. We're helping people to realize there's more out there than just what comes in the box. Um, and that right. in fact, if you make it yourself, it's not as difficult as it seems. Right. And by just investing in a few key ingredients, you can really have a huge transformation in your health. Um, you know, and so for me, kombucha was the gateway. Yes. Kombucha was the way in to learn about fermented foods and drinks. Um, well, I'm real curious. So you started your blog in 07, but what led you to um, start the blog in the first place? Well, you said your husband needing to make recipes, but, but what got you into traditional foods? Like, how did you even have a sense that those were going to be healthier for you and your family? Well, I mean, it had been certainly complicated for me uh, for years. And I'm talking years. Um, I had been plagued by all sorts of like issues like lack of sleep, um, unexplained weight gain, tremors. Um, and I kept going to the doctor. And, you know, all throughout, they started in college. And so I'd go to the doctor's office at the, the clinic at the college. And they'd be like, you're just under stress, honey. It sounds like a thyroid problem, but your labs are fine. You're just under stress. And I'm like, I don't think it's just stress. I think there's something else going on. But I think that we as a culture, well, the statistics prove we tend to, that women take longer to achieve diagnosis and we tend to ignore um, their symptoms. And I kept going to the doctor with all of these symptoms and they're like, well, you're just under stress. And so having no answers uh, from the conventional medical community, which is where I sought them, um, I had to start looking elsewhere, right? So I looked deep into my nutrition. Um, and at that time I was like, oh, well, I'll just become a vegetarian leaning vegan um, because that was that was I guess the only clarity that was provided you know 20 years ago and um, and then sure enough like I got so sick that my labs finally showed that I was really sick all that time <laughs> and, you know that it wasn't all in my head and I was it wasn't just stress I was really legitimately sick um, and so, uh, you know, for me, it was a mixture of conventional medical approach plus all of these, this adjunct care, which I had with a heavy focus on nutrition. Um, and my husband and I were, you know, really debating, is it, you know, do we go vegetarian? Do we go traditional foods? And I think, um, you know, exploring local farms in my area and really understanding that uh, farm to table connection, the connection of holistic management. Um, and also, you know, reading the China study and nutrition and physical degeneration side by side, I was like, well, okay, we're gonna go with nutrition and, and physical degeneration. That's the, that's the best. Um, and never looked back. You know, I think that my journey is long and complicated, but I think a lot of people can resonate with that. We've all had our experiences of being ignored and then finding the answers and the truth elsewhere. Yeah, and I think, you know, finding the truth elsewhere is finding the truth back in nature. And you're mm -hmm. talking about holistic management. So that's approaching farming, not just like it's a factory, like it's, you know, inputs, outputs, and who cares how the animals are treated. Right. It really does come down to, are the animals being cared for properly? That's because right. when they're cared for, not only does that mean the foods they're eating are actually suited for their digestive system and Imagine. therefore doesn't create additional illness in the animal before it's then 
uh, sent off to the consumer, but it also means that people have an opportunity to get a livelihood from the land. And you know, human beings, our role on this earth, on Gaia, is to be stewards yeah. for the land. And we have been so divorced from that through industrialization and, and, you know, we don't realize that so many of the symptoms of what we're experiencing is the result of this industrialization of, you know, putting poisons into the earth so that we get a higher yield or whatever, you know, whatever bottom line result they're looking for that doesn't consider the rest of the ecosystem because we can't escape the fact that we all live on the same planet. That's exactly and so right. just because you're putting poison on this piece of land doesn't mean that it doesn't affect every right. other person on the planet. And so... I think we both see that this has to stop. And I think um, our, you know, your books have been so instrumental in helping many people. In fact, there's a comment right here that says, you know, someone bought a copy of Broth and Stock because their husband's last name was McGrother. So <laughs> totally random. And it turned out to be their new Bible. So, you know, those happy uh, circumstances of the universe uh, led them to find you and to get real value. So, so let's just talk about your books. You have um, Nourish Kitchen, which of course was a reflection of all the great content you had on your blog. And then your second book was Broth in Stocks. Right. And, um, and so that's I remember I visiting you. on bone broths and nourishing soups. Um, and then the third book, of course, is Vibrant Botanicals, which I got a copy right here. I'll show you. Yay! It's and so pretty. Like, <laughs> thank you. This one is all about like, of course, nourishing food, but practical everyday herbalism. Like how do you start to incorporate nourishing um, herbs strategically into your diet? So if say, you know, you're slow to wake up in the morning, what are herbs that can boost your energy? Say that you are going to study um, which herbs help support mental clarity and memory. Um, which herbs can lift your mood and how do you use them? And best of all, it's like you're using them not just in simple herbal remedies, but in really delicious foods that you can feed your family for dinner um, or for dessert. And, well, and I love that you went and studied herbalism specifically because you already loved herbs and plants anyways, but you went and had a more formal study in order to put this together in a more comprehensive way. And so, right. you know, this isn't just someone going to their garden and picking things, although that's perfectly fine too. You've actually done the work to better understand how these plants can help us medicinally. Yeah, that's right. So, um, I, I've studied herbs for a number of years. Uh, Herbal Academy is a really fantastic resource if you're interested in learning online, um, as well as you know learning from local herbalists if you have any near you, um, is a fantastic resource. A lot of the, the work that came, went into vibrant botanicals, excuse me, uh, you know, was sourced from PubMed. You would go in and you could see all of these studies supporting, say, mint for digestion or um, lavender and chamomile for a better mood, motherwort for, for improved, um, for its anti-inflammatory effects and its improvements on anxiety. And, and I think that, you know, think of herbs and herbalism as this sort of quasi woo sort of like hippie thing, but the, um, there is a substantial amount of research that shows their efficacy. A lot of that research is coming out of uh, East Asia, Iran, um, and Eastern Europe. And it's really impressive to actually dive into the research and see how efficacious herbs can be, um, you know, in everyday life, of course, but also when studied clinically. And, and, you know, talk about herbalism has incredibly long traditions. When you look at China, they, uh, traditional Chinese medicine is deeply rooted. They have texts going back to the year, you know, 1000, you know, right. like really ancient texts that talk about uh, what human beings understood about herbalism. You have Ayurveda from India that also has its own system of diagnosing the body and, of course, using so many herbs and things that have become, you know, mainstream here in America, turmeric. Right. Certainly something that people really didn't know much about has, you know, curcumin, the active ingredient is something we're now all very aware of. And, you know, it's really wonderful that we're able to reconnect with these ancient traditions because, again, Mother Earth has had the answers for us the whole time. Um, so I would really love to know what excites you most about this book and what maybe one or two of your favorite recipes are. Oh, um, you know, what excites me most about this book is, is, 
reconnecting. It's, it, I find that the, the book was written to empower you uh, to reconnect, to connect with nature and to find what resonates with you. And so you're right that there are so many herbal traditions out there. There's Ayurveda, there's traditional Chinese medicine. And there's also a lot of um, traditional European folkloric medicine as well. Um, that I think is is really beautiful. It's emphasis on milky oats, it's emphasis on nettle, which is deeply nourishing. So being able to connect with those herbs that for me, resonated for me was really important. Um, but being able to kind of condense all of that complex information down into practical, easy snippets and easy recipes for a person who maybe hasn't studied herbalism for years was was really important to me because i think that everybody should be empowered to you know make their own remedies and and work with the botanicals around them um in terms of my favorite recipes there's a lot of them um and it's so fun going through this book and being like oh that tasted so good but there is a great recipe for a dandelion green salad so right about now you'll find a lot of dandelions are in season um and the greens are just wonderfully bitter, which is great for your digestive system. And of course, they're very nutrient dense, rich in vitamin K, uh, beta carotene. But they make a great salad. We serve them with like a um, an herby dressing with plenty of tarragon um, and a caraway breadcrumb, which is, oh gosh, it's so good. <laughs> um, there is also a chamomile poached pear which is very nice um, with vanilla bean um, and a beautiful blueberry compote with um, chamomile whipped cream was, was outrageously good. And then there's a blackberry sage lemonade that you have got to make. Sage is really good for supporting immunity and support, supporting mental clarity, especially as you age. And it blends really nicely with blackberry. They both have these kind of citrusy undercurrents happening. Yeah, well, and I mean, immunity is top of mind. Um, I, I've, I've been saying now that, you know, our immunity is our most valuable asset and it yields the best, the highest ROI. And so the way we do that is by investing in books like yours and making recipes like these and, and turning back to nature. And you're right about the European tradition as well as Native American tradition. You know, like every culture yeah. has their herbal tradition That's because right. humans have always relied on nature for her medicines. And what I love is say, there's so many kinds of sage. Um, you know, we might see one kind at the grocery store, but in fact, when you start looking around your neighborhood and foraging, and there's some really great apps. Like I've been using iNaturalist. I love to take pictures and compare it. And what do I have? And I, I just discovered there's, you know, whorehound um, in an area near me. And there's, uh, you know, brambleberries and, and all kinds of great things that heretofore I just didn't know. And because right. we don't have that connection, using technology to help close that gap is so valuable. Yes. Um, of course, you want to be use caution when consuming herbs from the wild. Absolutely. We'll just say that right there. Make sure you're not uh, picking up something you shouldn't consume. But those recipes all sound really delicious. We do have a sample for folks. If you Great. want to grab uh, some recipes. Now, the ones you mentioned are not in the sample, but that's OK, because it means they'll have more to look forward to when they grab the book. Um, one of the recipes, though, that was included is the hibiscus pineapple punch. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, so good. And, you know, in the sample, I included some ways in which we can use your recipes and ferment with them. So yeah. whether you're making that punch and using it as a flavoring or you're mixing it 50-50 with your ferment, like any of the recipes in your book can be applied um, or incorporate a fermented food element, Absolutely. even if it's not written into the recipe. Yeah. Um, but sign up. There's a link in the in the um, what is it called profile? There's a link to the profile where you can grab your your free sample. And we're also going to be giving away a copy of Viber Botanical. So we're really excited that we someone is going to win that. Um, so stay tuned for more information on how you can do that. Um, well, I wanted to get back to the book. And you know, what was one of the most surprising things you learned in creating the books, in all, in any of the books? Like what, what sort of lessons learned did you get out of this process of putting all this information together? So it, each of the books is like its own separate journey for me. You know, um, working primarily online, I'm limited to what are people going to search for, right? Well, you know, how do I support them in, in those easy, simple recipes? And in writing books, there is this full creative expression that can happen. 
And that's something that for me, I find very uh, intellectually and creatively satisfying um, that you can explore these ideas in a fuller way. I think for me, you know, this, this may sound odd, but in writing Vibrant Botanicals, the most surprising thing to me was that our dreams became, the whole family, all four of us, the dreams that we had became incredibly vivid while we were testing the recipes. So we always incorporate herbs into our daily life, but while we were testing, I was testing recipes for Vibrant Botanicals, that meant we were eating and drinking probably three or four times more <laughs> random herbs than, than we normally do. And our, our dreams became incredibly vivid during that time of testing. Um, and, you know, we could go into the the neurotransmitter side of herbs and how they work, and it can be very complicated, but, um, I think I would say that that's the most surprising thing is like how vivid my dreams came while testing these recipes. They work. I don't know. Well, and that's, you know, herbs do work, right? Yeah. So much of pharmaceutical medicine is actually predicated yes. on finding active ingredients, isolating active ingredients. And of course, what we know from a holistic perspective is the, what they call the entourage effect exactly. or you know, synergy, like really why certain herbs do so well isn't just because they have a single active ingredient, it's because they're also present with other elements that we may or may not have fully defined, right. but that create that net supportive benefit to it. And when we try to pharmaceuticalize and draw out only active ingredients, we see weird side effects that yes. happen as a result, because we actually need that whole energy of the plant present, as opposed to just one thing taken out of it. Exactly. I think that you know, really hit on something very interesting is that often pharmaceuticals are looking toward herbs and traditional medicine for that active component. Um, incidentally, this is something I learned while writing the book is that like something like 80 to 90% of the star anise production goes toward the production of, of uh, antivirals like Tamiflu. A very small per percentage of that, of um, star anise production actually goes into the culinary realm. Most of it ends up in pharmaceuticals. Um, and so there are these beautiful compounds that you find in herbs um, that can, that, that really have these subtle and very gentle effects um, but are still efficacious. And so we use the star, I use the star anise in our um, like a immunity tea, um, along with astragalus and cinnamon. And it's very, very delicious, especially on a cold winter day. Um, but yeah. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, when we use certain herbs, like I love you just talked about the dandelion salad because they're, they're in season right now. Right. Like there's a reason why certain herbs or spices are available in more abundance at different times of the year. Like I notice my lemon tree tends to really be full of fruit right in winter when I need vitamin C the most. And so when you start to pay attention to your natural environment or maybe you even plant some of these medicinal herbs in your garden, you start, you start to follow when they ebb and flow and it makes a lot of sense. Okay, now is the time we have dandelion salad. In the winter is when we need our warm cinnamon ginger exactly. tea because it's cold and we need to boost our immunity in a different way. And so there really is an infinite way in which we can incorporate these into our lives because they're going to also have a seasonal component as well. Um, so I just, I love drinking my flowers. I love drinking my herbs. And one of the recipes we do have in the sample is for your vanilla rose petal honey. Oh, that's such a, that is such a wonderful recipe to make. And it's, you know, it's such a pleasure to go out and to allow yourself the, the pleasure of intentionally picking your flowers for this. Um, you know, if you live in an area where you can access wild roses that are away from say streets and pollution, um, to go and you, you pluck them and, and it gets you outside and it gets you connected with the plants and you go home and you, you know, slather them in honey and add a vanilla bean and it, that subtle aroma, that uh, kind of astringent sweet quality of the roses uh, infuses into the honey and it, it's super delicious, uh, has a very calming, um, sweet and gentle energy. And it's about not only cooking, but the energetic qualities of connecting with with what's around you. And I think that's important too. 
Absolutely. Well, absolutely. And like, even to the point about dreaming more, right? Like this is how the herbalists and the witch doctors and the shamans yep. connected with plants. It was through dreams. And so, you know, we get really bogged down with thinking everything happens in one plane here, but the reality is we're multidimensional beings even as we exist on planet earth. And so we have relationships with plants. Um, I don't know. And, you know, as someone who loves to forage and find things, it, it's almost like they'll speak to you. You don't even know it, but suddenly you'll stumble across a patch of something and you're like, oh, this was meant just for me in a way because it sort of led you there. But also then the, the microbiome aspect, right? Mm -hmm. Like everything is covered in organisms. Yes. And so how you take those in when you're, gathering them they're interacting with your biome then the energy essences like the rose has the highest vibration and frequency i believe of all the flowers and so when you start incorporating you know these essences these um you know ephemeral energies that really are felt by the subtle body more than you know the, right. the analytical mind you end up absorbing a, just you take on a different quality and so your healing isn't just about symptom you know, attack it with a thing and then now it's over. It's really about looking at your body from that holistic perspective and your mental um, health, your emotional health, those things are just as important. And while there certainly is a dietary component of, as we've learned through the microbiome research, there's also just being in nature, communing with the plants and the environment around you. Like I've really gotten into just giving thanks to Gaia. I'll go out in my backyard, I just sit there, I hear the birds, they reveal themselves to me. I found a little hummingbird nest the other day and um, one day I was just sitting out there and she came and landed on a tree and cleaned herself and then right flew right to her nest. And it's like being able to witness nature yes. in action I think is so valuable because so much of our day is spent indoors, on screens, not paying attention to the natural world. Yeah, exactly. Especially this last year, you know? And it's, it's important for us to realize that we're I mean, part of nature too, right? And that we need to honor that side of ourselves through reconnection. And I think that that lack of connection, and it's something that I talk about in all, all three of my books is that I really believe that food is a way to reconnect with nature through the seasons, through nourishment. Um, I think that that's something that we're seriously lacking, that we're hungry for connection in many ways. And I think that food is such a great way to reconnect. Yeah, well, nourish, yeah. right? Like like so much of the food stuffs or the simulacrum that's out on the store shelves doesn't actually provide nourishment. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when we're in this country and we're taking a very narrow perspective, like, oh, obesity is people who can't control themselves. I a thousand percent disagree with that perspective. To me, it is a symptom of malnutrition. Your body is designed to seek out nutrients, but if what you're told on the label says healthy or low fat or any of those sort of um, words out there designed to, to inspire you to purchase uh, food stuffs, uh, which are different from food, um, you're actually starving. And so your body, because we really limit the information about herbalism and um, what, what types of nutrients we actually need to take in, I think, unfortunately, there's a lot of people who, again, we can't help but program. It's called a program. It's called programming. Um, you can't help but, but be disconnected from what it is that actually makes you feel good. And so my mission, and I think you're part of this too, is helping people reconnect with their bodies through health, through food, through, um, through fermented foods. And unfortunately, it often takes a, a health crisis or, you know, a situation where, their bodies are like completely like all the alarms are going off. Hey, pay attention to me, pay attention to me. And it, it's just unfortunate that people have to go through the allopathic system to get to one right. that can actually support health. Like allopathy has a place, but it should not be the primary line of defense. Like it's really great for trauma control. Yes. It's really great for, you know, extreme situations, but for prevention, for maintenance, we really need to go to our foods and supplies and plants first. I agree. I agree. I, I agree. I think that um, I think that prevention is is really key, and that um, you hold so much power um, and so much pleasure 
can be had from from that, those elements of prevention. So walking out in nature, um, cooking whole foods from scratch. Those are all, I guess, preventive, preventative care, uh, exploring your herbs and those that make you feel good. But it's, it's not just about health, right? It's about this deeper sense of nourishment. And, and I think the pursuit of pleasure, so much of what we hear about healthy food feels like it removes the pleasure aspect of it. And I think pleasure is also a nutrient, just like love is an ingredient. <laughs> Yes, I absolutely agree with that perspective. So I just want to say, if anyone here has any questions for myself or Jenny, go ahead and pop those into the chat. Um, we're going to give you more details about that giveaway. As mentioned before, there is that free sample. Go check out the link in the yeah. profile. You'll get so not only the hibiscus pineapple punch recipe, um, the vanilla rose petal honey, and there I suggest we could even make jun, yeah. uh, which is the fermented raw honey, out of an infused honey and create an amazing flavor profile, or we could use it to flavor a beverage. Um, and then the, the third recipe is the ginger mint fizz. That is a brilliant um, one for fermentation, by the way. So um, the way that recipe works, and it's, it is, ginger does wonders. Both ginger and mint do wonders to settle your stomach, right? And what, what else do we know about fermented foods is that they help support digestive health. So you have two botanicals that support digestion, and then you can combine that with, say, kombucha or water kefir or done and uh, create a delicious fermented vegetable. Uh, excuse me, not fermented vegetable. <laughs> Drink. 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 Yeah. Um, and so the recipe starts with uh, creating a, a honey ginger mint syrup with a little bit of lime for acidity. And then you have that base syrup, and it calls for in the book, uh, adding it to mineral water, which is fantastic. However, you can add it to your kombucha and, and run a second ferment. Uh, you could add it to your john. Uh, do a second ferment, or you could just blend it, you know, swirl some in, you know, and drink it that way too. And you've got this wonderful, like, compounded effect of digestive support, you know, the ginger, the mint, the buffering of the honey. And then, of course, you've got all of those good bugs from your kombucha. Well, let's just talk about honey for a minute. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love raw honey, and yeah. it has so many medicinal uses. It's one of those, um, what were they called? Uh, I'm going to get this wrong. Electuals? No, they were called um, Mela. In any case, there's this term of art that's used uh, with honey. Well, there was like Melomel, I think, which is uh -huh. the honey with the vinegar. Um, and of course, you would infuse herbs into that. But just on its own, medicinal honeys, whether that's from infusing herbs, used topically, used internally, it's just such an amazing food. It really is. Honey is, um, you know, there's that wonderful element of sweetness to it. And what I really like about honey is that the flavor comes from the flowers, right? So a blackberry flower honey is going to taste different from an orange blossom honey um, is going to taste different from, say, a buckwheat honey. And so they each have this very complex flavor. And the more flavor you have in something, that's an indicator of, of more nutrition, right? More micronutrients. Um, and I, I think that they, they are all, com you know, really beautiful. So we, I actually use honey quite a bit in the book. There's an oxymel, which I think you were thinking about, the that's vinegar. Uh, yeah, it's delicious. It's a vinegar honey um, uh, mixture uh, for sage and thyme. And uh, I think there's garlic and onion, and onion in there for yeah. um, cold and flu season, right? Because we have our uh, antiviral herbs and then our immune support of honey. And it's this wonderful balance of uh, nourishing foods and, uh, you know, vibrant, you know, botanicals, really, uh, that com come together to create not only food that tastes good, but like foods that you can eat and share and make with intention. There's strategy behind it, I, I suppose. Yeah, well, and um, I think intention, as we mentioned before, I love being a vital ingredient. Mm -hmm. And we can even transform a food stuff, okay? So let's say you're eating a processed food for whatever reason, like even just infusing that with love, you're going to have a better result. I yeah. realize this sounds maybe a little hocus pocus to some, maybe not those who follow us, <laughs> but um, but it really is true. It's that our intention and how we receive something. And that's why I think there's so much value to honoring our food. And I have to admit, I've been one of these people, I just shovel it in as fast as I can. And that doesn't serve me well, because uh, I end up with indigestion right. or whatnot. 
But when I am more intentional about the food I'm consuming, um, thinking about where it came from, thinking about, you know, how many rainfalls, how many, you know, how many hands, how many, how, how much went into just getting this food onto my plate, not even to mention, you know, myself or my husband cooking it or, you know, choosing it from the farmer's market or whatever it might be. Um, there's just so much energy that goes into our food. And I think the more we make um, nourishing ourselves a sacred endeavor, as opposed to just something you're doing, you know, while you're driving somewhere, <laughs> which sometimes you have to do, but um, I think that really serves our bodies in a better way as well. I think you're right. Um, for sure. For example, we know that good digestion happens when you're relaxed, right? Relaxation supports good digestion. We also know that, um, you know, digestion begins in the brain and with the eyes, you know, you look at your meal and it, all of these, you know, factors start to take place and then you smell and uh, maybe you taste something bitter and you can feel the digest, uh, you can feel, um, excuse me. Uh, the line bar starting. And <laughs> yeah, you can feel like you're, yourself starting to salivate. I was trying to think of a nicer word than you start to salivate, but <laughs> no, but you do you you start to salivate. It smells so good. And then that kickstarts yeah. the whole digestive process. And if you take the time to sit and breathe and breathe and be thankful, all of a sudden you're in that relaxed state, right? And so um, you can enjoy your meal better. Um, in addition to that, you again, with the pleasure component, uh, when you take pleasure in the way your food looks or the way your food smells or the way it, or the way it tastes, it actually can enhance the amount of nutrition you get from it. It's really fascinating. Pleasure and love and taking your time are three things that you can do uh, that don't cost a dime, right? And there are three ways that you can really um, enhance your meals. Well, and I love that you talk about the visual component because your photography, I mean, you know, I'm here taking pictures of my food, but they do not look like the gorgeous <laughs> images you're able to capture. So what, what sort of, you know, what got, how did you know you were a food photographer? What, what got you into uncovering the skill you have? I think that, you know, in order, for, you know, in order for me to stay, remain competitive as a blogger, I had to learn this skill. Um, and I've always been interested in art and, um, and especially the visual arts, but it's a skill that I had to learn. And it's one of the time, you know, when I'm, I, on any given day, I am pulled in about a million directions. You know, I've got children and homeschool and all of these things pulling at me. And by sitting down to like plate something beautifully to, to manage the light, um, to make sure that there's beautiful colors on the plate, it really helps to bring me a sense of joy and peace. So it's a pursuit of my own um, creativity and pleasure is what I have found. So I'd started off, you know, I have to do it to become, you know, competitive, right? Uh, but in the end, it's something that I find immensely satis satisfying from a creative perspective. I think our food should be beautiful. Agreed. And, you know, we're both fempreneurs and um, clearly have many uh, responsibilities and whatnot. How are you staying sane with all of the new challenges that have been heaped upon us? Is there a recipe in your book right. that you might recommend to folks if they're if feeling only, cold in every direction? If only uh, you find that solution for me. <laughs> no. um, I do. I actually do lean on certain herbs when I'm feeling stressed. Like um, I, I, I won't promise you that I have a solution for the uh, immense amount of uh, pressure that can come from uh, work and family and charity and all the obligations that we have on any given day. But I will say, I do try to support myself with herbs that I have found to be work working for me. And those include motherwort. Um, they include uh, lemon balm was a game changer for me. Um, so motherwort, lemon balm, and of course, uh, nettle, which is uh, deeply nourishing and some red raspberry leaf in there works for me as well. And I think that um, in my experience, many women resonate with red raspberry leaf, that it, they find that it works for them as well. Yeah, you know, I have a way I have, you know, several herbs and jars and whatnot. And so what I'll do is every week, I make a weekly concoction. 
Um, but the way I do it is I use the sway test. So people might have different ways to sort of tune into what's resonating with them. For me, that really works. Or basically I'll hold the jar to my chest and just ask, is this part of my formulation this week? And I either sway forward for yes or backwards for no. Um, and that works for me. And so lately I've been making um, mugwort because mm-hmm. um, it's anti-parasitic and I'm, you know, working on keeping everything clean at this time awesome. of year. Um, I'm also incorporating, but lemon balm came in really strong on that one, as did rose hips and rose petals. So even though there's some bitterness to the mugwort, the rose is really, um, well, and roses are really high in vitamin C. Yeah. I don't know that everybody knows that. Same with the rose hip, of course, which is that beautiful red um, bulb that forms later after the petals have fallen off. And so that's one of the ways that I just really listen to my body. And often I'll have that mixed with So I made a forage spring syrup with like pine needles and different herbs from my garden. And then I'll also throw some kombucha in there. So I get like this whole melange of herbs and a little sweetness, a little bitter, a little fermented. And that just really works for me. And so um, just in closing, were there any other thoughts or anything else you wanted to share about um, your books? Your Where can people find you? Like, I know people are going to be thirsty for more information <laughs> about you and what you do. Where do they find Jenny right. online? So you can find me. Uh, just follow me at Nourish Kitchen here on Instagram. Um, you can join our Facebook community. Just look up Nourish Kitchen there. And, of course, if you visit nourishkitchen.com, there are – hundreds and hundreds of deeply nourishing recipes. Many of them are herbal focused, loads of bone broth and lots and lots of fermented good, goodness on that site. Um, so yeah, just Nourished Kitchen. And you can find all of my books uh, anywhere books are sold. So that includes your local bookshop as well as online retailers like you know Amazon, bookshop.org or Barnes and Noble. And if you live